Welcome to Revenue Radio. I've brought on today one of the greatest storytellers, CROs, dads, husbands, and amazing humans I've ever met in my entire life. If you haven't met Roger, this is Roger. He's one of our CROs. He's one of our longest standing CROs. And he also happens to have an extremely high success rate with his clients and is a wealth of knowledge. But one thing I love about Roger that we're going to center on today is that he is like that perfect CRO with the blend of marketing and sales, and there's no bias. So we're going to talk about bias with CROs, what we see in the market, talk about advantages, disadvantages, depending on how you grow up in revenue and going down that CRO path, but without spoiling all the good stuff in the show. Roger, welcome. Thank you. Glad to be here. Well, I'm glad that you are here. So if I told you all that Roger's also a stand-up comedian, he would be really <laughs> mad at me because then he would feel a lot of pressure that like he had to be funny on this episode. <laughs> so I'm going to not tell you that little secret about him. Oh. We'll just keep it between us. We're just going to keep just, it between we us. We will not say anything. Oh, so, <laughs> so on that note, I want to talk about bias with the CRO role. What have you predominantly seen with CROs? What is their usual track record? I think... Or the, track record, not track record, but you know what I mean, like history and their career trajectory, I guess. Mostly with CROs, I see... I'm seeing this more and more, actually, as of even today. Like the... Uh, more bias towards sales. It, it, I, that I see, um, mm -hmm. I definitely see, you know, I think the, I, and you kind of see some that are biased towards marketing, but mainly as sales because yes. it's kind of the, the, you know, the, the, natural, fruit, the like, natural to tend, you know, you can kind of pull the levers a little quicker. It's a little, uh, for, for revenue, I think on sales. So I think that's probably why. Yeah, I agree. Um, but I think that, it's, but you do see well-rounded CROs. I think there's more in the market now than there used to be, mm -hmm. but it has historically been very sales-driven role. Yeah. So your 50-50 split in your career between marketing and sales. You started door-to-door -door sales. I've heard you say you hated the job so much you did it five <laughs> years in a row to pay for college. Yep. What can you pull out from that experience that you still use today in executive revenue leadership? Gosh, from door-to-door -door sales, just, um, <clears throat> I think when I'm working with sales teams, a lot of the grassroots kind of sales, like talk tracks, um, uh, just memorized uh, talk tracks that are, I can explain it a little bit better in those terms because mm -hmm. Uh, it really does help because when you have it's all well, I'll go back to stand up too. Mm -hmm. When you memorize your your talk tracks, for example, are you going to say that verbatim every mm -hmm. single time? Probably not. Mm -mm. But when you have the skeleton memorized, you start to morph into your own. So I think that I we we, we had to memorize that uh, with door to door sales because if you had to wing it at every every door. No, you're done. You're done. You're, t you're dead in the water. Uh, and so we memorize this, but I kind of take that to, uh, to, to those sales teams. And we talk mm -hmm. through because even, you know, phone scripts and talk tracks and demos and QBRs for, you know, all of that. Um, the question is like, Oh, I just like to do my own thing. Like you definitely need to kind of put your twist on this, but it, there's a comfort level of knowing exactly the skeleton of what mm -hmm. you need to cover to be effective and then put your, put your twist on that. And it kind of morphs into your own. So I think I just off the top of my head. What about the grit and perseverance? Like you've got to have some chops to be able to do that. Has that translated in your ability as a leader to command, to have authority, to stand in front of a room, to direct, to be in uncomfortable situations. I mean, that has to come from, getting over that fear of rejection in a door-to-door -door sale? Oh, most definitely. I think that that just not giving up and and he, you take your – it rolls off my back. I don't mm -hmm. I don't really I'm, – I'm not thick skin. I, I'm just I, – I don't see it. Like I, <laughs> I, But I think that grit kind of fed over to like my entire career. Like mm -hmm. it's just – I don't have failures at all. Like I have learning – have lessons. And yeah. So, I mean, you get that, you get a ton of, I mean, I'm knocking on tons of doors and 
uh, getting tons of rejection, and I think that's just fed over, and I just don't see the failure side of it. I see it as like, okay, I learned a little bit better here and a little bit more there, and then also, yeah, I don't really get nervous. <laughs> no, that's good. It's good. I, I also feel that a lot for my early sales career has given me the ability to go through very challenging situations. I think being in outside sales as a first role allowed me to get a little bit of that thicker skin to get through the rejections, to also learn how to be a young lady in front of a big room of people and have to overcome <laughs> two dozen objections and a bunch of naysayers and altering opinions. And I, I loved being in mid-market sales for that reason and finding seven, eight people in the room and identifying who all the players were. It's like being a psychologist and going in, seeing the battlefield, being a step ahead. And like, I absolutely loved my sales career. I feel like so much of that, of that is transferable. But then I started to round out my path to CRO with a marketing degree of course, that was very different because that was uh, 2006 to 2009, I think, is when I was in college. I did it later in life. Mm -hmm. And I'm a college dropout, uh, <laughs> so we're clear. I went back because my boss told me I had to uh, later, and I did it through University of Phoenix. But I did learn some things from marketing, which did help in the sales career. But it wasn't until we made the massive pivot as a company that I had to double down and learn marketing. And it was a foreign language to the salesperson. And it was super hard to get hit through my head of what it was. And I had to fully immerse myself. In fact, the only way I actually learned it was by doing it. And yeah. we changed over everything in our company. We actually built an inbound marketing engine and it was the only way I figured it out. Like I wasn't able to grasp it through the learning. So you made a pivot because you were you started out in sales. So what was it like for you when you took on that first marketing role? Was it hard or was it easy for you? I thought it was, I found it pretty easy. It's what I really wanted to do. It's like I navigated towards that. And I think that, that made it easier, mm. but it wasn't just intuitive, like to understand everything. And just like you, I went back to NYU. Oh, that's right. I went to NYU and got a marketing, um, digital marketing certification, which was an intensive uh, I think five months. And it really opened my eyes because I was working for a software development firm and we were building cool stuff like applications. And mm. I was, I started getting very interested in like, okay, how is Spotify going to take this <laughs> micro site and get it out to the world? And so I think, but that said, what was hard for me is the transfer of getting other people to understand that I was both. Mm, uh, yes. Because I was, I was seeing, I had, you know, 10 plus years in serious sales, like yeah. only sales, sales director, BPS, that, those types of roles all the way from door to door sales mm. person all the way up. So that was the hardest part. Mm. So I had to, I really had to prove myself. And I think with, with uh, digital marketing, marketing, there's so many buckets and you kind of, you have to, yeah. I, I, I remember telling uh, one of a family member who is a, a legit, um, he runs digital marketing teams for, for Indeed. And I told him, he goes, what do you want to do? I go, I want to get into digital marketing. He goes, what do you want to do? Because there's so many buckets. <laughs> go, so, on. Yeah, go on. And? Uh, and I'm like, I want to digital market. I don't... It, <laughs> I want to digitally market I, I want to the digitally people. market things and uh, <laughs> put things in the digital. And so put things in the digital. He's like, okay, okay you got to get. So he, but that was early on, and he like really kind of direct. He's like, okay, pick a few and get good at those before you move on. So I actually had trouble getting a, and I was like, I'm I'm later in my career, and I could not for the life of me get looked at as a serious marketer because I had this long sales background. So I started my own marketing firm. Oh my gosh. <laughs> when the world won't take you seriously, just absolutely defy and go do your own thing. Yep. I and maybe have done that myself. Yep. So what I, what I, I took that advice and when I was working with, and I worked with a lot of brands here in Colorado, the, uh, some, some outdoor brands and brands that I was really interested in. And I just approached them. I was like, what, what are the holes in your marketing team right now? Mm -hmm. Is it email marketing? Is it? And then I would just go to town and learn that stuff. And I got really good at email marketing. And um, I think that's how I made the transition and YouTube and 
all any certification, <laughs> any certification I could possibly get. I yeah, I was working with a group in Provo, Utah, a, a, a marketing t- um, company, a digital marketing mm-hmm. company, and I asked them how, like, oh, did you guys go to school and all this other stuff? They're like, YouTube, man. YouTube. They're like, we learn everything on YouTube. I'm like, and they're like some major SEO <laughs> wizards, and I'm like, okay, cool. It's like, what book should I read? They're like, YouTube. <laughs> I was like, okay, got it, got it. So, so is that under uh, on your LinkedIn profile under education? YouTube, YouTube. Yeah, I'm a YouTube pro. <laughs> I love YouTube, but but I get the little sort of the NYU certifications over here. But I'm actually going to YouTube. Exactly. So. Yeah, exactly. And look, it's not a bad strategy. I swear, <laughs> that's like how this younger generation. We're older now, so we can say that the younger generation, the younger generation. is in the school of YouTube. And now they're in the school of TikTok, which is scary because I'm on TikTok now and there are very questionable things that show in my newsfeed. In fact, I don't know what happened to my TikTok. Maybe somebody can tell me because I am like the oldest millennial, like the oldest bracket. So I was later to TikTok and I used to actually enjoy the videos, but like something happened in my newsfeed has like really inappropriate videos. And I'm like, this is awful. And to think of how many teenagers and young people, I'm like, what are the filters on their TikTok? I just couldn't even believe that type of content yeah. was even legal to have on there. And then I keep reading all these reports that now TikTok is turning into like the number one search engine and place for information. I'm like, oh, God, what are they What are they asking on here? Because I am very scared of the answers that they are getting. But YouTube, at least I feel like, yeah, has better tell. quality content. So if anyone can help me out, that would be great. I've just shut down the app. I would refuse to open it anymore. Um, So I've like closed it out. Like I'm going to have to like uninstall it and reinstall. I just don't know what happened. But anyway, I digress. So (laughs) you start an agency. You're brilliant and just saying, I'll fill the gaps. What are your holes? Let me fill it. I'm going to be the marketer that steps in and complements what you already have. Let's move the needle. Let's make this happen. So a lot of lessons learned during that time. And then you got some credibility. Mm -hmm. People actually saw you then like as a marketer, which was what you originally wanted to do. So then one of those clients says, we need you. (laughs) Like we can't live without you. You need to come and do this. We have way more opportunity for you to do this full time. So when you stepped into that and that was that your first full time marketing, like at that level gig? Yeah, definitely. It was how uh, was it different from the agency world? It was awesome. It was just basically waking up every day and doing this, 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 what I was doing for uh, tons of mm-hmm. tons of different companies for one company. And so I was able to kind of I started out with I was the email and uh, email marketing, and then I ran their platform. So mm. I ran it. I ran um, their their um, uh, Shopify. Whew. So I learned. I didn't know Shopify before that. I learned Shopify <laughs> really, really quick. <laughs> I'd never meant to become an expert in Shopify, but uh, then I just kind of brought a lot of those little things that I knew, and mm-hmm. uh, within a couple of years, I was the CMO. So, um, but it was. That was, but it was my first like one client, one mm-hmm. one brand, all day every day working on that, coming up with new strategies and coming up with new uh, new ways to reach. So when you were sitting in that role, did you miss sales or did you get to have influence over? Well, I guess it because it was a product, so we didn't mm-hmm. have a sales team here, right? No distribution. It was all ecom. Mm-hmm. Okay, so that's a bad question to ask. So we came knocking on your door. <laughs> Sure. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Well, yeah. We were you were refer- yeah. Referred. Referred. Yes. Referred. Mm-hmm. And as soon as I saw the LinkedIn profile, I won the beard is like, <laughs> I was like, I'm in on the beard. Second, I'm looking at the diversity in the experience. And I finally felt like, hallelujah, the clouds had parted. And I finally found a real, at the time we were recruiting for VPs of revenue that are now CROs. Like I found a real one, you guys, (laughs) he's equal parts. Mm -hmm. Like he gets it. And then to find out what attracted you the most to house of revenue was the fact that a firm finally understood holistic revenue. Yeah. Yeah, It was like a match out of the gate. It really was. Cause I, well, I, I, I'll never forget that conversation. Cause that's to, Go back a little bit. 
the sales though, the sales background has helped in every bit of my marketing, mm. every bit of it, because it's a focus, it's a numbers focus and I hate vanity <laughs> metrics and uh, I, I just can't take it because if it's not driving, so I understood that relationship. Mm. And so when we talked, I remember, I was like, oh my God, because I read the job description and at first I was like, I think this sounds like me and Patrick goes, dude, that is you. <laughs> and I, I go, okay, cool. So we talked and I was like, oh my gosh, you're, you're speaking my, because that's everything I wanted to do with my agency. I didn't have the mm. background and I didn't have the ability to do it for clients because they're like, oh, you're just a marketing, marketing. I'm like, oh, actually I understand sales pretty well. Um, or, <laughs> yeah. or so, um, but when you, I remember the question I asked you, I was like, okay, this is all cool. I like this. Who does the work? And you were like, we do it. I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm in. <laughs> so I was like, how, how, after that, I was like, how do I get this job? <laughs> like, oh, what do I need to do? Oh, and I went and I got my HubSpot certification <laughs> that night. <laughs> so, oh yes always so. a good sign of a candidate <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> when I so. get that email a few people have done that and get the email the next morning I went ahead and did my <laughs> HubSpot cert I'm like oh Katie this person <laughs> is serious <laughs> right. about this so bringing us then to current day I feel like one of the reasons why your strategies are so good and the reason why you've just had this track record Roger I mean I can I envision you when I'm meeting with prospective clients, and I know you can only handle as, as so much. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> I've overloaded this guy, <laughs> um, and he's very gracious about it. But I never, I never fear. I never have to worry. I never question on if Roger's going to be the right fit because some of our clients are a little sales heavier, marketing heavier. And so sometimes I'm like, oh my gosh, this is a perfect fit for so-and-so because the engagement is more focused on revenue operations or this is all about channel and I've got a channel sales expert CRO. So there's sometimes there's these fits, but I have like this perfect hybrid CRO that I could literally put on anything and I know you're going to win, no pressure. <laughs> and I know you're going to win, but I think it's because you have a file drawer that you can pull from and flex so many different strategies based on this hybrid experience. And as I look forward to what the CRO role is evolving to, like I just want to give our audience the encouragement that if you're looking at this path, go do the one that you haven't done yet. Yeah. So if you're a marketer, like go, go take a sales job, find anybody, go do the door to door sales, go take the most unpleasant sales job and flex the muscle and learn the skill. Go, if you're a salesperson, go get the digital marketing certificate. I know there's so many programs that offer that, universities that do it. Like I know out here in Denver, DU has one. That pro program looked pretty solid. There's other universities like CSU Global Campus and others out here locally. Well, CSU Global Campus is global, but I mean, you could do that from anywhere. Go get the hands-on experience, but also go intern somewhere. Go take on a side consulting project. Go shadow somebody. Go get a mentor. Go take the role. Do the thing do the work and build your file drawer. Because if you can go into a CRO role where you don't have bias and you are viewing the revenue problems holistically. Okay. Sorry. I'll get off of this in a no, second. I'm going to ask your it. opinion. I'm working on a little side project right now and they brought us in and they said, we think it's a middle of funnel sales problem. In fact, they said in your due diligence, don't even worry about looking at top of funnel. They said top of funnel isn't our problem. We have more than enough leads. So I was like, uh-huh. Okay. I won't look at it. <laughs> right. right. Oh, they just swore it was a sales challenge. Thank goodness. I've done the work at, on both sides of sales and marketing and RevOps, right? And CS, like, like all of revenue, because we just got to deliver the gap analysis. It wasn't a middle funnel problem. It's brand, it's go-to-market strategy, yeah. it's product, it's the website, it's marketing, it's sales, a little bit on CS. They have a killer CS team and it's the tech stack. And how short-sighted, or in, and not like short-sighted in a bad way, but if a CRO was brought in based on what they thought the challenge was, which was mostly sales, so you brought in a sales bias CRO as in a marketing, they would have never saw the problem. Right. And so they would have invested hundreds of thousands of dollars 
trying to solve a sales problem when it was really a much larger holistic problem. Can I just say one more thing on this? Mm-hmm. Transparently, that is what they did two times before meeting with House of Revenue. They had always diagnosed it as a sales problem and they've spent hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not more, bringing in the sales, the new head of sales, the new sales methodology, the new sales trainer. And not only was that like not improving sales, it actually went backwards. So I'm so grateful that we were brought in. I'm so honored to be able to work with this company because they're seeing it holistically now and they were so grateful in the delivery. You're seeing all the stuff we think we knew but we never like saw it all at the same time. Like that was a lot to take in. I'm like, yeah, because it was literally every piece of revenue in this whole right. company yeah. needs to be elevated and aligned on one mission in order to win. So I believe your superpower as a non-biased CRO, because I don't correct me if I'm wrong. You don't see, like you don't isolate and see, do you see a sales problem that isn't also marketing, CS, like the whole bow tie funnel. Cause if it's a sales problem, there's probably something else too. It could be hindering. Right. Uh, yeah. Tell me more about that. No, I think it, you're, you're dead on. Like I think every one of our clients says that I've had just come in. Typically that we could say that a little bit to a certain degree about all of them. They think they have a marketing problem, but then you look at their, in their sales, it's, not actually a marketing problem. It actually is the, the sales portion of that, or they're not talking. Mm. Typically, they're not talking. Uh, and then the CS side of everything. So I think I think there's a little bit of that in every one of them. Uh, but they're too close to the problem. Mm-hmm. They're too close to it. They self it's you know they self diagnose like you said, and then they typically yes. if they have a <laughs> yeah, and they're they're likely going to be biased. Uh, and so, but yeah, I think every single I'm I'm. Just thinking of one engagement that we've had that came in, and they were like, "Oh, we we just need some some marketing help." Nope, <laughs> it was it was we're we're revamping the whole sales every single thing in the sales process, and um and they're like, "Wow, we did not realize this." So, I uh, I think yeah, to take it that's what attracted me here is and that's what I've always loved is looking at the whole picture mm-hmm. like, all the way through, um so. No, I couldn't agree more. I think it's, it's, but you do have those sales bias CROs or sales bias, just leaders, actually mm-hmm. CEOs too. Yep. Uh, they're like sales fix everything. Well, sort of, but, uh, <sighs> you, you know, you, you have a lot, a lot of other factors to look at and think about. Um, and then you have CEOs that are more marketing biased. Um, sure. so. Or they, product, or marketing product. product, product or, yep. Yeah. Yep. In the element and they're not connecting it to sales. And yeah. that's where they're lacking. Mm-hmm. And then you put all of that together and you put strategies and, and full thought process on everything and connect them all. Mm-hmm. That's where we see skill and that's where we see growth. That's exactly right. It's exactly right. So here's my word to the wise as we wrap up today's episode. The CRO role needs to be taken a lot more seriously than it is. I'm tired of a CRO title getting slapped on, especially in smaller companies to a glorified account executive or head of sales. Let them be an unbelievable account executive or head of sales. They are needed. But do not give them a CRO title. If they do not understand, go to market strategy, brand strategy, revenue operations, marketing engines, sales engines, customer success, account management, support, revenue operations, if I didn't already say it. They have to understand holistically. And my second advice for the CEOs out there is give your CRO time, please, to research, build, and test. When you bring in a CRO, especially a high caliber CRO who has done the scale, that is invaluable knowledge. Give them the time they are asking for to research, to validate, to build, validate, test. Because if you're putting pressure or your board's putting pressure on them or investors to produce, you just made one of the biggest mistakes because a short-term revenue gain just came at the expense of long-term revenue. And that is what we see so often. So give your CRO a chance and make sure the CRO is an actual CRO. And do me a favor, If you need help writing your CRO job description, like 
I'll give you ours. You can look at it. I'm more than happy to share it. The bottom line is the job description is where it starts because if you give it a title, but in the job description, it's all sales bias. Guess who you're going to attract? So that's it on bias for CROs. Please start raising up holistic revenue leaders. And if you are a revenue leader, I want to give you the encouragement. Roger's a walking example. Now the guy's absolutely killing it in this career and his clients love him. The success is unbelievable. No pressure. (laughs) (laughs) But this is amazing to see you in action and how it almost feels effortless where I know it's not. I mean, people don't see what you're doing behind the scenes. But anywho, I'm going to wrap today. If you want to see that job description, send us a message. You can email at info at houseofrevenue.com or leave a comment on any of our social channels and we will get it over to you. Roger, thank you so much for joining. Thanks for having me. This was fun. Oh, but what are you doing this weekend? I need some help on my Shopify site. (laughs) God, put me to work. (laughs) Let's go. I'd love to get back in there. (laughs) All right. Until next time.